All right, everyone. That's that was almost like the the dinner bell there. Uh, this um, this session is going to be recorded, and I think that's um, a fitting time to get started today. Uh, so, Kim, if you're ready, why don't we uh, kick it off? And thanks again for being here. Um, welcome yeah, my everybody. pleasure. I'm excited. Good, good. Me too. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, the topic today is addressing development for children through play. Um, really uh, so excited to have um, my panelists here with me, and I'll introduce her shortly, uh, with the main theme being uh, thinking about giving you um, trusted resources, trusted information on how to think about the whole child approach to assessing and diagnosing developmental delays and really giving you a lot of information um, that you can build your village up and understand um, where you're at now and where you want to go and hopefully we'll leave you with a lot of helpful resources. Um, so I want to just give you a little bit of information on who we'll be sharing some time with today. Um, my name is Gretchen Richer and I'm the head of family experience here at Vivi. Um, Vivi is an early learning and child care center based in New York City with three brick and mortar sites, um, really focusing on child care for zero to five years of age. And we've also branched out over the last year to an in-home program where we take all of the wonderful care and, and learning that happens inside the walls of the campuses at Vivi and bringing them to your home. So really trying to meet our parents and families wherever they are, literally, physically, emotionally, you name it. And that's a really great segue to think about how this uh, webinar got started. Um, I, uh, my son, as you can see on the, the page here, he's about three and a half and he goes to Vivi Tribeca two days a week. And he had recently started um, physical therapy a uh, number of months back. And I had just finished dropping him off and I got to meet Kim Mitchell, who she'll share a little bit more about herself uh, in a sec. Um, but starting to learn her background and, and know that Crosby um, just started at Vivi and we got to talking and I got to sharing um, my experience with Noah and his physical therapy experiences was such a blessing to understand and to have gone through that process. And this was actually Kim's life's work. So it, it was really great to have a commonality there. And to then I, I went back to the office and started you know, Googling her and Googling her work and realized that the approach that she and her company takes is very aligned with Vivi and very aligned with, I think, a lot of the philosophies that our, our parents are yearning for. Um, and so knowing that my my story had a lot of resonance uh, and Kim's work had a lot of resonance with me, I know that I'm not the only one out there. And for me, my story started prior to the pandemic, but I think just wanting to know where your child's at developmentally will always be a, a part of the conversation. And we're so thankful for Kim to add value to uh, the conversation today. So Kim, if you don't mind um, taking the mic and sharing a little bit about who you are and um, what your company does. Yeah, sure. Um, so. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here today. I'm super excited to be chatting with everybody here. Um, my name is Kim Mitchell, like Gretchen said, and I'm a licensed physical therapist. Um, I've been working with children for over 10 years. I live and work in New York City. Um, I've done therapy in homes, I've done therapy in schools, and obviously I do therapy in a clinic. Um, TheraPlay is the name of my company and business. It's turning 10 this year. And we have two locations in New York City where we provide physical, occupational, and speech therapy for children up to age eight. Um, and in addition to that, we've added a summer camp to our program. We do a preschool alternative program and we run various social skills and developmental play groups. So, I have a lot of knowledge. I've been in, in the business for a while. Um, so hopefully I can, can share some resources and tips with you. There were some really awesome questions that came through. Um, some of them were really child specific. So if I don't touch on it, or if I kind of gloss over it, please feel free to reach out to me at any point after this. Um, and I'm happy to set up a time to talk additionally with people because I know a lot of this, this kind of fed into the first slide um, is very child specific. So. Um, I it, sometimes an umbrella statement doesn't doesn't do it justice. That's amazing. Thank you for offering that up. And uh, I think I shared, you know, we met at the Vivi Tribeca vestibule. And so that means Kim's also a mom. And so I am a mom. You have a dual <laughs> approach to things. You've got the mom approach and the therapist approach, which maybe sometimes don't always jive. <laughs> yes. 
for sure. Yeah, it's uh, my daughter just turned one on July 1st. So it's been a real journey. Um, and it's been an eye opening experience for me also with what I do. Um, and just sort of having a new lens to look at this with. So I get where everybody's at. I'm in it with you on all different levels. So happy to share what we can what we can today. Well, thank you. Let's talk a little bit more about what we'll share. Uh, so we are going to start with the beginning, where do you start really um, trying to understand where your starting point is versus um, where you want to go and, and what are the things you might want to start asking or looking for um, as you start thinking through this. Um, we'll really dig into Kim's approach, the whole child approach to diagnosis and treatment. What does that really mean and, and why is that um, effective? And then thinking about all of the other players that are involved in supporting your child's success. So how to effectively partner with your pediatrician, where to find additional support and resources, and then just touching a little bit on the COVID related changes to milestones. What I know from speaking to Kim, we're probably not gonna find out all of the information about how milestones shifted until we've kind of gone through all of this, but we know that um, we're all in the same boat together in the same big C together, I think, as, as Kim's been saying. Uh, so we'll touch upon that. And of course, leave some uh, time for Q&A with the audience. And as Kim said, um, the first 40, 45 minutes will be really uh, a discussion between uh, myself and Kim. And we hope that we're gonna answer a lot of those general questions that you um, sent to us in advance. So we designed this in a way that can, can tackle some of those questions. But of course, um, at the end, leaving some time for your own specific questions. So let's start at the very beginning. Whoops, there we go. Development 101 here. Um, I think you said this right before uh, our first slide about a lot of us are focused on our uniqueness and difference, the differences of our child. So you wanna just touch upon where we're all at and, and how we're all special? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so I think, you know, in all of this, it's really important to remember that each child is unique and develops at their own pace. Um, so in terms of understanding your child's development, my best piece of advice is truly just to stop and, and watch your child, watch what they're doing, watch where they're at. So much of my job as a physical therapist is truly just watching children and then following their lead. Um, so I'm not saying that like, leave your children to be raised by wolves and everything is gonna turn out fine. But I think that if we take a step back, our children will show us sort of what they need um, and, and where they're going with all of that. So um, there are some really great resources that you can access um, because there are general age ranges where specific milestones are expected to be met. Um, and it's important to remember that this is a range, right? So some children are gonna be on the earlier end of the range, some children are gonna be on the later end, and some children are gonna be outliers and fall outside that range. So I would caution getting too focused on these, these numbers and, and try to look at your child as a whole. Um, I took a whole semester of classes on developmental milestones. So, I mean, I could spend days talking about this. Um, so we're not gonna get into like the nitty gritty of what they should be doing between X date and X date. Um, but I encourage you to look at these resources um, and Gretchen dropped them into the slide below. So I'm just gonna like quickly touch on them and let you know why I like them, what I like, what I don't like, and just give you like a general overview of these resources online. Um, all of them are going to provide you helpful information on what to expect, what behaviors and actions are, we'll say typical for a, a certain age range and use them as a guide. And remember that like if your child was maybe late um, with rolling, take this into account when thinking about other developmental skills that like maybe we're just on the later end of the scale, but we're still moving forward with our development. Um, so the three that I really like, the first one is Love Every. This is like a new company that came out. I'm not sponsored by them. I wish I should be because I promote them all the time. Um, but they make toy kits, they make play gyms, they make lots of products that are really developmentally appropriate for kids. Um, and each of their kits comes with a guide that provides you with uh, developmental milestones, how to play with the toys that are provided, and additional activities you can do around the house. Um, pro tip and a hack, you don't have to buy the kit to get this information. You can sign up for their newsletter and you put in your child's birth date and they're going to send you 
a general overview of what's in that guide. Um, like every three months, you'll get sort of an update. Um, so I think, what's that? Just lost your endorsement with that pro hack there. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. That's my hack though. You don't have to pay for it. I do love the kits, but um, you know, that's, that goes without saying, but you can sign up for that newsletter. It's really outlined very nicely. They'll provide you photos. Um, and the company is actually um, was founded by an occupational therapist. So I really like stand behind their values and the way that they present information. Um, so that's the first one that I like. The second one that I think is a good resource is called pathways.org. It's a bit more clinical, um, but they have videos and photos that you can look at to understand what some of these things mean. Like, what does it mean to be transferring an object from one hand to the other? You can watch a video and see a child doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it has this really cool thing, actually, it's called, a, they call it the baby games calendar, where you put in your child's birth date, and it's going to provide you with activities that you can do for that age range. Um, so that's really cool. And the activities are fairly simple and pretty easy to do at home. So that's another good one. Um, and then the third one, it's not my favorite. Um, it is the CDC. So I do trust what they put out, um, but it doesn't present the information, the skills like in a range. It just has like at two months, you should be doing X, Y, and Z. Um, I don't love that because again, all of this happens in a range, um, but there are checklists and photos and videos that you can look at. There aren't any activities, it's just purely milestones. So if you want something that's sort of like straight to the point and um, gives you some checklists, that's a great resource um, that you can use. Those are my three, my, my top three hits. I love it because we have kind of low to high on specificity and rigidity. And, and I really love that the, the first two give you um, games and give you uh, ideas of what to do with your child because I think we all want to help our children and we want to play with them and to be able to combine those two functions you really you feel like you're being a successful parent and it's all of that too. <laughs> Now, would you also say and I use and I use these as a resource like so like it's OK to have to use this. Nobody knows what to do. Like I go to this and I'm like, how can I help my child? And then I use it in my therapy sessions, too. So like that's no a shame. Yeah, no that's shame. In using these. <laughs> um, are you as a parent, are you as suggestions for parents? Are you asking to assess your child, like watch them in a group or watch them individually? Or are you doing a little bit of both? To kind Because of, I know we always compare against one another and that's sometimes good, but can oftentimes be really distorting? Yeah, I think uh, both. I think a mixture, right? Watch your child in their natural environment, see what their interests are, see what they're drawn to, how are they moving? Um, and then if you are participating in some sort of music or movement class or whatever it happens to be, yeah, see what the other kids are doing. But also like note that like some kids are gonna be way up here and some kids are going to be down here and you might be in the middle or you you know so take notice of that too don't just get so focused on like oh but they're not doing xyz how about what are they doing right so let's always start with that where are we what are they doing and how can we work from that point um so i think that that's important to note too that's great to mention and uh, i think we popped these three other bullet points in as really kind of the same um we know we we're doubling down on this idea that you are not alone out there, um, especially in this past year with adjustments and milestones and catching up and worries that we have. And and want to just say a couple words about that. Yeah, sure. So first and foremost, COVID was an anomaly, right? Like this came, it happened. No, we're all, I say we're all in the same ocean, but we're all in different boats, right? Like my boat maybe had one oar and I was like bailing myself out with the other hand. And maybe you were just like beautifully sailing in your yacht across the ocean. But either way, we were all in the same ocean dealing with this together, right? So um, we have to take it for what it was and we have to move forward and start fresh. Um, in terms of like where I'm at with this, I had a baby in July, 2020. I was running this business for kids um, and families who are dealing with developmental challenges. I was talking to parents on the daily about their fears, their struggles. I get it. Um, there's an increased level of concern for everyone with what happened or didn't happen during COVID. Um, so we're all navigating this together and we need to start fresh this up and coming school year. As parents, we need to first have compassion and understanding for ourselves that this last year was like chalk it up to what it was and we can, you know, move forward. 
Um, and I think as a society, what's really important for educators and professionals in this field of child development to understand and realize is there needs to be an adjustment in the in the thoughts about what is typical right now, right? Because we're all coming out of sort of this COVID fog um, and we need to adjust our, our way of thinking and be a little bit more gentle in our approach. So in terms of like some trends that I'm seeing, again, like I can't tell you how this has impacted you know, children ages zero to five, I'm sure there'll be studies that are done on it. I'm just gonna talk anecdotally about what I've seen. Social interaction, number one, everyone's struggling with it. Adults, children, like I don't know how to interact with people anymore. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's a big one, like seeing people without their masks, being able to interact with other children. Um, a big one is challenges being able to separate from your primary caregivers, right? You think of this little child, you've been in your house for the last year plus, you have your own things, you have your people, you are living your best life. And then all of a sudden it's like, now we have to go to school or to therapy, or you have a babysitter coming into your house um, and your world's turned upside down. You're like, what, what is happening? So now you have to follow someone else's schedule. You have to share your toys. You have to adapt to this new environment. So I think as parents, it's important to be mindful that this is what's happening um, and, and be there to support your children. And if you have a solid you know, childcare team and therapy team or whatever it is in your corner, hopefully they're mindful of this, of this as well, right? So I think that the, the social piece is, is definitely a challenge. Um, and then the second thing that we're seeing a lot of, so sensory processing is sort of this fuzzy term. Um, Pre-COVID, it was something that would be floating around, but it, it's coming, coming to light in a different way now. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I'll just, you know, general terms, sensory processing is how your body interprets sensory information that's coming in. So for example, you're walking down the street, right? You hear cars beeping around you. You can see people walking. You are smelling in New York City, maybe a street vendor, or if you will have the luxury of walking down a, a residential block, maybe you're smelling cut grass. Um, and so you're feeling your feet on the ground and the clothes on your body. So that's all coming into your body. Some of it you don't even notice. It's, you're oblivious to it. Some of it might be a little jarring but you're able to handle it. And some of it might like be kind of nice, like the smell of cut grass. You're like, ooh, this is nice and this is calming. Um, but we've spent like over a year in our own bubbles, right? And so some of these sensations that children may have been indifferent to or might have been a little alarming, but they were able to tolerate it are now becoming more intolerable or they're having what we would call in, in the therapy world difficulty processing the information that's coming in. So let me give you an example. As a grown up, I moved to way upstate New York during the bulk of COVID, came back in late June. And when I came back to New York City, I was overwhelmed with the sights, the smells, the sound. But I'm typically developing adult, right? So I could tell my husband, it's too hot. I need to go inside. If things were loud, I could cover my ears. If something was stinky, I would move across the street. But for children, they don't really have all of those strategies, right? So what are we seeing? They're melting down, they're shutting down, their behavior is like all wacky and you can't figure out what's going on. Um, they're becoming what we call dysregulated. Their body is like, well, I can't process all this stuff that's coming in. Um, is this the end of the world? No. Can we reprogram our systems to cope with all of this stuff again? Yes, we can. But will it take time and do we have to be forgiving and understanding and like let this happen organically? Yes, absolutely. We have to be very patient with this and like we're, we're reacclimating ourselves to a new world. Um, so those are the two big things that we're really seeing coming out of this and it, it's fixable, right? We can, we can work on it. Thank you for this. That's um, so helpful. I hope that everyone out there is feeling um, at least like they have a lot of friends in this big ocean and that we're, we're all probably feeling a lot of the same emotions and anxieties and noticing a lot of the same things with our kids. And I think that's the first step. And so we'll talk about trusting your gut in a sec, but once, if you're in this area and you still think, hmm, I really think I need to reach out to a, a resource team to support me in helping my child adjust, helping my child um, start to take steps. Uh, I'm going to 
move on to this approach that that there's one uh, one approach that we want to talk about today called the whole child approach um and you know how to start thinking through what the next steps might be so uh can you share a, a little bit about your approach and and the benefits what's what is the supporting through play idea yeah sure um so we work at theraplay through what we call a whole child approach um and what do i mean when i say that so i'm a physical therapist maybe a child gets referred to me because they're not walking yet i could have them come in i could do exercises for strengthening um provide some exercises to be done at home and send them on their way we might see progress we, we might not or i can kind of widen my lens here and dive deeper and look at all of the elements that makes this child who they are. What's the home environment like? Are there siblings? Are there pets? Do you live in an apartment? Do you live in a house? Do they go to school? Is there a nanny? Um, what's the family dynamic? Does the child receive other therapies? Are there other concerns? Like we really need to dive deep into what's going on. How are they sleeping? How are they eating? Um, what does their day look like? So these are all really important things that we have to consider or that you know, I think are important that are to, to be considered when you do start therapy or just in general when you're thinking about your child um, and in terms of their development. So um, I think the, the, the important thing to remember about whole child approach is child, right? We're working with these small, tiny humans, their brains and systems are still developing. Um, and so we, again, we are adults, we are typically developing. So we have to come at our children in a way that they're going to understand. And what do they understand is play, right? Um, Fred Rogers has this amazing quote that I use as like my life mantra. And it says, play is often talked about as if it were relief from serious learning. But for children, play is serious learning. Play is really the work of childhood. So we use play because it's developmentally appropriate for children. So circling back to those developmental milestones and those resources I gave you, there are milestones for socialization and for play. Um, so you can look at those uh, resources and again, use them as a guide. So I think the best way to think about play um, is to think about really as exploration of the environment and engaging with the people and things around us. It's not necessarily having all this stuff and putting dolls in a dollhouse and um, play looks different at different ages and for different children. So we also have to remember that we explore our environment with all of our senses. Again, going back to that sensory processing. So we see, we smell, we touch, we hear, and we taste. That's how we explore our environment. And for children, that is play, exploring and engaging with those around us. Um, so just a, you know, a quick example in terms of like developmentally, um, young children mouth toys as a way of exploring them. So, and that's play for them. So you hand a rattle to a four month old, they're not gonna be like, oh, I should shake this and it's gonna make a fun sound. They're more likely thinking, hmm, what is this? What does this feel like? They're going to put it in their mouth and they're going to learn about it. The more they're presented with this object, they're going to say, oh, it's a cool color. When I turn it, it makes this sound. Uh, feels, how does it feel in my mouth? It's heavy in my hand. So um, these are all ways that the child is exploring an object. Their brain is like, boop, 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 and that they're playing, right? Um, so a quick note about like toys and play in general, it can come very naturally. You don't have to force it. You can plan out activities. Um, but I also love this quote from Jay Milburn and it says, you can turn almost any child safe material into an open-ended toy simply by allowing your child to explore it freely. Mm -hmm. So this goes back to watching your child and following their lead, right? So what I do at home, if I'm feeling bored with the toys, um, maybe Crosby is not, but like I'm over it. We'll go into a new space in our house um, and I'll just like pull out random items. Say we go into the kitchen, I'll pull out some Tupperware, some kitchen safe utensils, maybe the paper towels, whatever it seems like might be cool. And I'll just like let her go at it. And then, you know, maybe she decides the spatula is a drumstick. Maybe she wants the Tupperware as a hat. Um, there's a lot of different things that she can do. And I just watch her and I kind of follow her lead. Um, and that's play, right? Pillows on the floor, it's a mountain and you're climbing over it, but you're also working on crawling and climbing. Um, I have like a bajillion ideas 
for household objects and how they can be used to play. So I'm happy to consult, but I think in general, like this is a good rule of thumb, like just go explore a new place and let them see new things um, and, and know that in their brain, they're playing, they're exploring their environment. Thank you for all this. I have a couple takeaways. It sounds like the journey is really the most important part rather than the destination. So um, <laughs> if crawling on pillows is the journey, then that is really the most important thing that they could be doing versus you know the thing that you really thought was cool. Um, I think I noticed this in my first assessment at PT that the questioning, that the whole first session was just asking about our lives and every aspect of our lives as a family and i i had just assumed we were going to go in and start like doing push-ups or walking up steps and and it it you when you start to peel back the onion you as a parent start to think oh well i i can see how that affects this and i can see how this would correlate to this and i I also really loved, and I would have never, thank goodness I'm not a physical therapist, I would have never thought about these things, but they're amazing, but you know, she took his interests so transportation and cars and trucks were interesting to him. So he had to hold the cars and then walk up the steps. And I, I just love the creativity of this all being work, but based in, in what drives them, which is really aligned to on the Vivi approach is that we are looking to the child to drive the, the curriculum and drive the day. So are there um, are there places out there that are not doing the whole child approach? Is, is there maybe like this is the physical therapy way and I am going to make you do push ups and, and walk up the steps and we're only focusing on getting that one thing accomplished or any derivatives out there? Yeah, I mean, I would love to say that everyone comes from this approach, but there are definitely people who have their blinders on and sort of stay in their lane. Um, so I think if your child, um, if you do decide to pursue therapy or your child needs therapy in the future, I think it's important to look for a place that um, is open to collaboration. Maybe they have multiple therapies that happen in the space at the same time, or they have resources that they can use and bounce ideas off of. Um, I think children are so dynamic and there's so many, you know, you said peeling back the onion, like there's so many layers to what's going on that it's really important to um, have open communication with your team and they know what's going on and you know what's going on um, so that you can really like kind of hone in on, on the target issues. And like you're saying, basic things, like what are their interests? Like they want to play with cars. Great. Let's play with cars and let's make this fun. Right. Um, so yeah, I think, I think there are places out there that again are in their lane. Makes sense. Maybe that's for everyone. Makes sense. <laughs> Not for us over here. Uh, <laughs> many times I think we are we're we're going to our pediatrician first because that's the doctor that we've had since the beginning. And and I I was under the misconception that my pediatrician would solve all of my childhood development uh, questions and needs, and soon started to realize well that's not necessarily there. Um, you know, they are not the end all be all for every problem that you have. And I think you said something really important to say, like, it's unfair to your pediatrician to expect all of this from them. So, you know, where and how to start, what what typically leads people to next steps and, and going to the pediatrician? Yeah, sure. So I think I just want to start this slide off by saying, like, if you're worried about being a good parent, you already are one. Someone told me that once, and I think it's like good to sit with that. Um, you're here because you care and you want the absolute best for your child. Um, so just know that you're already a superstar and, and kind of have that in your, in your core that you are your child's world and they're lucky to have you. So if this is a journey that you need to, um, that you need to take or a road you need to go down, just have that, you know, in your gut that like you are your child's best advocate. So I always recommend starting with the pediatrician. Um, because if there are multiple things going on, the, the, you know, the pediatrician might be able to make connections for certain things um, that might be, there might be like a, a broader scheme of, of things that are going on. Um, I think when you show up to your pediatrician, show up with videos, photos, a written list of your concerns and questions, and then this will ensure that you won't forget anything, right? Pediatricians can be intimidating. We put them on this pedestal, they've been to med school, like, 
they're amazing people, but they're also part of your team and they need to be working with you. So like I work with healthcare professionals all day. I talk to neuropsychologists and all these fancy schmancy people. I get in with my pediatrician and I'm like a stuttering, stumbling disaster. And she's like the most chill lady in the world. And I can't even like get the words out. So do I show up with a written list? Yeah, you bet I do. Because nine times out of 10, I've forgotten what I want to talk about. Say I'm going there for a cough. The second I walk in the door, Crosby's like, no, I don't have a cough anymore. I'm not going to cough. And then the second we walk out, she's like hacking up, you know, whatever. So take videos, have it, have videos of your natural environment, what you're concerned about, what you're seeing or not seeing and present that to your pediatrician. Um, I think videotaping can be a real asset when you're, uh, when you have concerns so that they can actually see what's happening. Um, so I think in terms of going to your pediatrician, like Gretchen said, they, you know, they are not physical therapists, they are not speech therapists, they may have a broad understanding of these um, areas of development, but it's not their bread and butter, right? So let's say you've done your research, you've looked at all the age ranges, you're not getting stuck if your child is a little bit behind, right? We're going to give them time to like, let it flow. Um, but you want to see if more can be done. Cool. Ask the questions that you need to ask of your pediatrician. Um, and, you know, what's worst case scenario? They're like, let's wait. But you on the inside are screaming like, I can't wait anymore, right? You're so, you just want to like know that everything's going to be okay. So I think um, you can calmly say to them, I don't want to wait, right? Can you write me a prescription for speech therapy? Can you um, provide me with some resources? Do you have a recommendation on who I should go to? Or, you know, can I look into it on my own? I have rarely encountered a pediatrician that's not going to write you a prescription. Um, and nine times out of 10, they'll call us and be like, what are you seeing? What do you think? Um, they're happy to have like a partner in this, right? Um, so I think that that's important to remember that they are a part of your team. And if you're not happy with them or your values are not aligning, like you can also make a change that's allowed to. Um, so I think that's important to know just in terms of everything, doctors, therapists, educators, whatever, if it's not aligning with your values, you have the power to make the change. Um, you're your child's best advocate. So I think you start with the pediatrician, you give them all of your concerns, you let them know what's happening and you see where they want to go with that. And if you don't like their answer, you still have the option to pursue things on your own. So you are working with your pediatrician. They're very much behind you. They've written some scripts. You've trusted your gut. You've moved forward. Uh, and now we've got a team. Whoa, everybody, stop it. Got a little excited here. There we go. <laughs> um who who are who's on your team what are the players um how do they work together so if it's uh, multiple therapists one therapist and also how are parents um working together yeah so i really like to use the word team right because again i think we can put therapists and doctors and whatever in this zone of like they are the end all be all um and they have all of the knowledge and i as a parent I don't know anything, um, but that's untrue, right? These people are members of your team. Members of a team play different roles, but we're all um, working towards a common goal. They have different skills, but we're all working towards a common goal. So um, say you wanna move forward with therapy, how do you start to build this team, right? Well, number one, I say ask around, ask your pediatrician, reach out to your social media channels, use Google, um, find what, find something that maybe resonates with you, but then do your due diligence. As a parent, you need to feel comfortable with the space and the people that you're going to be working with. Um, so if you're going to a place like a sensory gym, call the office. How does the front desk treat you? How do you feel about their responsiveness to your emails? Um, and going back to what we were saying about whole child approach, does the clinic do multiple therapies? Are they a single therapy provider? Um, and I would look for a place that is, or a service that's going to include the parent in the treatment planning and is going to provide you with things to do at home. Um, because therapy is not magic. Children don't change overnight. Um, and there is work that needs to be done at home outside of therapy, right? Like as a grown up, you go to the gym two times a week and the rest of the week you're sitting on your couch eating ice cream, you're not gonna reach your fitness goals. And so the same is true for your children. Um, 
the therapist, hopefully, if you have a good team, will provide you activities and exercises that you can be doing at home, and you as the parent need to follow through. Again, if it's too hard, if it's unreasonable, communicate that with your team. These are people that are supposed to be working with you um, to find the best options to help you help your child succeed. Uh, there's, uh, I love, um, I loved about our physical therapist is that she asked if we had goals and I knew I had a couple, but I also knew that I, I didn't know what I didn't know. So it, it, but it was, it was great because it didn't, it gave me permission to speak and be, a, be on the team. Um, I think it's okay to say, how do I partner with you? What's my role in this? Because I, I was assuming we would get homework, but you'd go in you and you, if you've never done it before, you never know what to expect. So really feel free to say, tell me what to do. How, how am I playing the best part of, of my role? Yeah, 100%. I think, you know, you need to be open and honest as a parent about your goals, right? If your goal is for your child to be able to walk four city blocks to school, let your therapist know that that's what you want to do. Um, because they may have different goals based on what they're seeing. And that's not to say that their goals are better or your goals are better. They're going to work on all of those things. And there might be little goals that they try to meet before reaching that big goal. But I think it's important for you to communicate your needs so that the therapist knows, you know, what's going on in your life and how they can help you. So that's important too. Again, just open communication across the board. Amazing. Um, so this, this sounds like a no brainer to really um, focus on the whole child approach, to focus on a team effort and to really start to build your, your team and your resources. There are a couple alternative processes out there. I, I find are not quite as easy um, and sort of based in bureaucracy a little bit, but I'd love for you to just share some other options that, that parents do go through. Yeah, so there's there's a few different avenues you can take if you do uh, want to pursue therapy for your child. Um, the, the first one, if your child is between the ages of zero and three, um, there's a thing called early intervention. Early intervention is a federal program, it's nationwide, um, and it provides like I said, therapy services for children birth to three. In New York City, there's no cost to the family. Um, in other states, there's like a small cost sharing uh, formula that they do and, and the family can be responsible for a small cost. Um, and early intervention typically happens in the home. Uh, the therapist will come to your home and if say your child's you know, at school or at daycare all day, then, then they will find you a therapist that can provide the therapy in that environment. Um, and the parent is expected to be part of the therapy session, um, again, so that you can learn the activities uh, to carry over to help your child, you know, progress even faster than they would with just getting uh, the one-on-one -on -one therapy with the therapist. So that's an option. Um, if your child's older than three, the next level is the Department of Education. Um, so they're going to provide your services three and up. Um, in New York City, again, also a free service for families. I think actually across the board, it's a free service uh, nationwide. It's done in the school. Um, in certain circumstances in the city, you can get it done in a gym like TheraPlay. Um, but for most places, from what I understand, it's, it's done in the school because again, it's Department of Education. Um, these services are wonderful. Caveat with them, they can take a long time to get the services in place or to get the evaluation done. Um, and so what happens? Like I'm talking about evaluation and this and that. So basically what happens is uh, for both of these early intervention and Department of Ed, the process is the same. Um, you know, you raise your concern. There are agencies that you can reach out to that can come and provide the initial evaluation. And this is gonna be done by a, a team of professionals. You're, you're more likely gonna, you're probably gonna have more than one evaluation done. So it could be physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, there's an educational component, there's a social worker, they might make a referral to a neuropsychologist. So just be prepared that there might be multiple people um, coming and going and, and making their observations um, with the goal, again, of getting your child all the support that they need. Um, again, this can take a long time. So if you are very concerned and you wanna move forward with something faster, I would recommend seeking out services either privately or through your insurance. Um, your insurance company, if you call them, can provide you with, you know, lists of physical therapists who are in your network. Um, most hospitals have outpatient clinics, and they're going to accept 
you know, pretty much any insurance that's out there. So that's a good place to start if you're kind of like at a loss. Um, but those are those are your different avenues that you that you can take. Thank you so much. Uh, I feel like I have more support and resources, um, both to be able to share with parents and to to have for myself. Um, I want to just remind everybody what we covered before we jump into questions. Um, first, just really where we start that development 101. If you're thinking about where you think your child should be, if there are resources um, that you can do to support them through play, and then also kind of keep a little bit of tabs on the developmental milestones, but also take your cues from them as well. Um, the whole child approach, effectively partnering with your pediatrician and, and so finding those um, supports and resources out there. And speaking of support, I uh, want to turn it over to the audience to ask Kim um, any questions that you might have after listening to us today. And you're welcome to pop that into the chat function and we'd be happy to um, answer them for you. I probably won't answer them. Kim will likely answer them. give you a couple minutes to think through the questions. Well, Kim, I think you just. <laughs> I just, I just provided everyone with all the information. World right? of, of solutions. Um, <laughs> well, I'm actually. I think what I, what I just want to say is like a takeaway for all of this um, is if you have concerns, ask right there's there's really two best case scenarios in this situation um one you have concerns about your child you go through an, an evaluation and you find out everything's on track awesome the second best case scenario is maybe things are not on track but then you start to build your team of amazing professionals and then you support your child so that they can soar right so there's really no like good and bad in this um i think being your child's advocate and just asking those questions, doing your research, you can't lose. Um, you don't know what you don't know. So I think you you just start doing your research and, and reach out to people that can help you. I think is like my biggest my biggest thing that I wanted to really just hammer home. Oh, and I think I've heard you say this in not, not these exact words, but why re, I really love partnering with you and I think it's the head and the heart really, you know, do your research, um, look at those milestones, forget those milestones, look at them again, but forget them again. But then at the, at the end of the day, trust your gut, trust what you know as a parent and what you know as your child. Um, and then you, you know, whatever steps you need to take are going to be the right steps. Um, I have uh, one question here. Are there resources about development through play that we could share with our au pair whose first language is in Spanish, not English? Hmm. Wonderful question. Um, I know that the CDC website, you can translate um, that information into Spanish. Um, but let me actually, let me look into that. And Gretchen, I will circle back with you um, because I think there are some resources that are in Spanish. I just don't have them off the top of my head. Awesome, great, Isadora. So two things I heard is the CDC website, which you can look up now, but we'll be following up with all of those links that um, Kim recommended. And um, also stay tuned. So she's gonna look for some more info for us. Um, and then I think I might have to stop. Oh, I can see it this way too. Um, what is the best way for speech therapy? Um, has a two-year-old who has a speech delay and a social worker um, said he might have mild autism. So maybe thinking about next steps for how to design speech therapy, where to go for more resources. Um, yeah, can you just repeat the first part of that question? Is there sure. one? What is the best way for speech therapy? I have a two-year-old who has a speech delay and a social worker, I think the instead of this word state, I think a social worker says, he might have mild autism. Okay, so I have a few issues with this situation. Number one, a social worker cannot diagnose autism. I'm gonna like go on my soapbox for a minute here. Um, so first of all, if that is a concern, um, I think uh, next steps is referral to either a developmental pediatrician or a neuropsychologist. Those are the two specialists that are going to um evaluate your child if there are concerns for autism or other types of developmental delays so that would be my my first like 
line. And would, um, you, would you have a, sorry to interrupt you, if you have a current pediatrician, would you ask them for recommendations on a developmental pediatrician, et cetera? Like, like go there yeah, first. Yeah, absolutely. You can, yep, you can ask your pediatrician. Um, I mean, obviously start with your pediatrician and even get their thoughts and then see if they can get you a referral. Um, and if they can't, again, just go back, you can go back to all of those, those resources, your social networks, Google, your insurance company, see what's out there um, and see who you can get in with. So that would be my number one. Um, social workers cannot diagnose autism. So I'm going to calm down for a minute. <laughs> um, and then number two, in terms of speech therapy, um, if the child is not already receiving speech therapy, uh, it's absolutely something that can help. Uh, if you're seeing some social delays and some language delays. Um, so a two-year-old, again, you can use early intervention or you can, again, go through your insurance um, or pay privately for services. Um, I think, uh, hopefully I answered, there was like a multiple part question. So hopefully I, I hit the... I, I'm, I'm gonna add on to a, that question. Could you go the route where you just wanna, you, you've seen the speech delays first which sounds like there's a speech delay first would you would you go could you recommend going to a speech therapist in the whole child approach and then we're also mm -hmm. potentially seeing other things and what i've found and there's there's also places that have therapy in multiple areas but also have those subject matter experts like they could actually be working under the same building to address speech and or other concerns you might have yeah, 100 percent if the language delay is is concern number one definitely start with speech therapy and you can ask the questions of them too do you think i need a referral um should we dive deeper into my child's development um again speech therapists cannot make a diagnosis for this so but but if you have a speech therapist who is looking at the whole picture and the whole child they might say hey occupational therapy might be really helpful too um and let's refer you out to a developmental pediatrician so that they can do some more um some more assessments and and see what else might possibly be going on thank you lots of good tips in there um uh, i hope that was helpful uh any other questions we can help answer okay i'm gonna I'm going to start doing the wrap up thing, which sometimes means there's one more question that's going to pop up. But for now, um, <laughs> I I am so grateful to you, Kim. Um, and I know I, our audience must be and I'm, I'm grateful that you're a, a Vivi mom. Um, I've every conversation I've had with you, I learn a little bit more and I helped you also help give moms more grace and and remind them to be graceful with themselves as as parents so thank you for being the expert um in play therapy but thank you for also being um a compassionate mom uh for those audience members out there if you want to keep learning from kim um, her website is here theraplaynyc.com check it out it is just so much fun to go through and there are tons of resources on the page um and if you're interested in checking out our upcoming events we actually have one uh, next week on the 10th called mom brain so if you're feeling like you want to know more about what that is and how to get it back uh please <laughs> Come to uh, come see us next week. And Kim, thank you so much for being a part of this. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, and like I said, please feel free to reach out if you guys think of any questions afterwards. Um, I'm here and I have a great team that can collaborate with you as well. So mm -hmm. happy to be a part of it. Thanks, Kim. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs> bye.